Oh my. <laughs> Thank you. Hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great assembly. I will bless the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be again in the house of our God. Welcome to Frankfurt United Methodist Church. Uh, as you can see in your bulletins, uh, we have some announcements. Uh, we have pastoral visitation cards on the back table. Uh, choir practice is Wednesdays at 7. Now, if you're interested at all in being in the choir, um, I'm proof you don't have to have talent to be able to do it. We have the entire gamut of talent from me to Woody. So if you're, you, you fit somewhere in that spectrum, um, please come. Our Christmas cantata is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's, it's got some fun pieces. It's got some, some deep and contemplative pieces. Um, and if you would like to be a part of that, um, it will be a blessing to you. And Wednesday at 7 here at Frankfurt, everybody. 7 o'clock Frankfurt. Practice here at Frankfurt at 7 on Wednesday. Thank you, June. Uh, we're having our Thanksgiving community service next Sunday. Uh, November 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, we are working very hard to get in touch with all the local pastors and try to get them involved in the service. Um, so far we have um, one who has uh, um, said he would do something, but uh, we're, we're going to keep pushing. We have two, Pastor Todd. Too. Todd, uh, yes, Todd, Pastor Todd, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so uh, Dan Bennett will be doing the, the, uh, the sermon uh, Todd Thomas from the Presbyterian uh, will be doing something, and I'll, I'll be doing something as well. Um, the first Sunday of Advent is November 27th. It is two weeks from now. Um, it just amazes me how quickly this year has gone by. I spent some time last night with my, um, my Bible study software, uh, going through and numbering our Matthew messages. This morning is part 33 of that sermon series. Um, and it just, it, feel, it feels like it's, um, yeah, it feels like it's, it's, it's going so slowly. But Advent uh, is two weeks from now. Uh, in that vein, we have an Advent sign-up sheet. If you'd like to be an Advent reader or if you'd like to light a candle one morning, um, the sign-up sheet is in the back. Please, uh, please consider doing so. Um, December 3rd, our choir will perform at the Historic Church Walk. We'll be performing 
at uh, St. Mary's in Chillicothe. Uh, do we have any other information on that, June? The walk starts at 2 o'clock at St. Peter's Church. If you want to start, I think they're visiting four churches. Um, you start there at St. Peter's, then you'll follow the group to wherever they're going. But if you don't want to walk and you just want to see St. Mary's and have refreshments and listen to us, then I would arrive at St. Mary's around 3 o'clock and get you a seat, and they'll be seating people and ready for you. So, uh, 3 o'clock at St. Mary's, 2 o'clock at St. Peter's, if you want to join the historical walk. Thank you. Yeah, St. Mary's is over by the library, the main library building, if anybody uh, knows. And... I've, I've attended a couple of services in St. Mary's, and it's absolutely a beautiful church. Um, our Christmas cantata will be December 11th, uh, Sunday, December 11th, here at 3 p.m., and again at Clarksburg at 7 p.m. Um, once again, refreshments will be served after the Clarksburg performance. Um, Saturday, December 24th, is Christmas Eve. That's Saturday, December 24th. Uh, I want to talk to some folks, uh, maybe the board members. I, I, I do need to speak to the board members uh, after the service, if we could, um, about uh, I, I'd like to have a Christmas Eve service. I wanted, wondered if we also wanted to have a Christmas morning service. Uh, I would be fine with that, but I know that some people um, have lots to do that day. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and hammer that out this morning after, after service under the clock, if we could. Are okay, um, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, uh, all right. <clears throat> all right, are there any other announcements? Before we move on, I'd like to do something I was supposed to do last week. Uh, we, we have, how many are here, Karen? 112, you said? 102. 102. I knew there was a two there somewhere. 102 <clears throat> um, Operation Christmas Child boxes. Now, I know I've told this story before, but it's such a good story, I'll tell it again. My sister works with missionaries who go to Honduras and Nicaragua. She's a Spanish teacher in Lancaster, and she acts as translator uh, but she also uh, helps a lot with uh, the, the kids and, and things like that. She, was, she works with other missionaries when she goes down there. And she told me another missionary told her the story of these Christmas boxes. She said she was present in some African country when the boxes were being distributed. And one little boy opened his box and found that it was filled with nothing but socks. He started to cry. The missionary frantically went looking for another box to find for this boy, a box filled with toys. She ran over to him with this box and he looked up at her and he said, no, you don't understand. He said, no one in my family owns a pair of socks. And now we all do. I promise you, none of these boxes are filled with socks. We had a big packing party uh, there's toys and there's games and there's soap and there's, there's all kinds of wonderful things in these boxes. But somebody somewhere in the world decided at one point to pack a box with socks. And the Lord took that box all the way across the world and gave it to the one child on the planet who desperately wanted it. If you don't think that God's hand is involved in this program, you are sorely mistaken. So would you bow your hearts with me, please, as we ask the Lord to bless and direct each of these boxes for the greatest possible good. Blessed and holy Lord, we ask that you would accept from us these meager offerings of toys and soap and shoeboxes. 
Lord, we ask that you would bless these, that you would send them forth to bless your children. That the word of the Lord would truly go forth from Frankfurt United Methodist Church. And that your hand would be in all of these boxes. Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct them to the children to whom they are supposed to go. Those who would be most blessed by them. And that they would, in these boxes and in our gifts, see the light of Jesus Christ shining in the world. Blessed Lord, we thank you and we give you praise in Christ's holy name. Amen. Absolutely. The, uh, the bazaar is on the 26th. Uh, if you'd like to, out of the school, if you'd like to donate something, uh, please bring it in. Please let Karen know. Um, and um, if you'd like to go out and, and find yourself some unique gifts on November 26th at the school, um, that would be great. All right. Um, now, uh, if there aren't any other announcements, let's turn to our hymnals. For praise song number 143 on Eagle's Wings. Next, we'll turn to page 697. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of America.
This is our remembrance of Memorial Day. It was, uh, it was two days ago. Um, but um, are there any veterans in the congregation? If you are at our, please raise your hands. Okay. Uh, we, we missed Dick. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, some funny news. This morning... I grabbed my stuff up to come to church, and I thought, no, I don't need my backpack this morning. I take it every morning, and I walked out the door, and I was pulling into Frankfurt when I remembered that the, the USB drive, you can be seated, please, that the USB drive that had the slides on it was clipped to my backpack. So I frantically ran back to the office, and I called my wife, and I asked her to upload the, the, the slides from my computer desktop to Google Drive. Well, she had no idea what any of that meant. And so we walked through, I, she's, a, she's a brilliant lady, she just doesn't do computers. Um, we walked through all of that and we, we, had to, we had to find it. Actually, it wasn't on my desktop, so we had to use the, the USB drive that was clipped to my backpack, how ironic. And we finally got all of that taken care of. I got it uploaded to Google Drive, I downloaded it here and it took 10 minutes to download back here because for some reason it just didn't want to finish uploading. I don't know why. I finally got it onto a uh, USB stick, brought it back and put it on the desk back there. That, that took 25 minutes of my time this morning and the laptop doesn't work. For some reason, heaven does not want you to see those slides or something. I don't know. But we will proceed anyway. Um, on the slides, which is why I'm taking this time now to do that, on the slides was the responsive reading, which we will just simply forego this morning. Um, and that brings us to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. Susan? I got a phone call from Steve last week, and they done the test play with one. Check back his lung, find out he had a box, he found out he can't breathe. Mm -hmm. It was inconclusive, so he's got to go back Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday, for surgery to get a better test uh, sample. Okay, Great. we will pray for Steve. Terry? Okay, great. We will continue praying for Carolyn. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Okay, we'll pray for John. Excellent. All right. The Sidmore? Similar. Similar. S-I-M-L-E-R? S-E-M-L-E-R. S-E-M-L-E-R. Okay, thank you. All right. Any, yes? Kathleen? Okay. Roy? Absolutely. We'll pray for our schools. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Barb and Dave? All right.
Absolutely. We'll pray for the persecuted Christians around the world. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? If not, Heather. Absolutely. Yeah. A kingdom divided against itself. All right. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? Let's go before the throne. Gracious and loving God, we enter into your presence with shouts of joy, with songs of praise, with worship and thanksgiving, with adoration. Lord, you are holy, you are true, you are good and righteous and mighty. Lord, you call us into your presence and we come, we obey, we, we come before you, Lord, to praise and worship you, to fellowship with your people, to draw more closely to your precious side. Lord, the things of this earth are passing away, but your words will never pass away. The things in our lives will be consumed with fire. But those things done for you will be bathed in radiant light. Lord, open our eyes. Lord, show us the truth of your world. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him took up the cross. Lord, help us to see as you would have us to see. Show us the truth in this world, Lord, and motivate us to do something about it. Father, we are your people. We are the flock that you shepherd. Blessed and holy Lord, we have sinned against heaven and against our fellow men. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have left undone those things we should have accomplished, and there is within us no peace. But blessed Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, that you will cleanse us from all our trespasses, and forgive us for all our unrighteousness. And so, blessed Lord, in these next few moments, surrounded by your holy people in the privacy of our own hearts, we make our confession before you.
And so, blessed Lord, through our confession and through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, we are forgiven. And it is truly marvelous in our sight. Now, Father, as a righteous and a redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those requests we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you those we have kept hidden in our hearts. Father, we ask that you would be with Steve and with Steve, with Carolyn, with John, and with John. Lord, we ask your hand of blessing on the Semler family, on Kathleen, on Barb and Dave. Lord, we ask your continued hand of blessing on our schools and students, teachers, staff, and administrators. Lord, we ask that you would continue to empower them for the good work to which you have called them. Father, we ask your hand of protection, healing, comfort, and peace on those persecuted Christians around the world, especially as we enter into this Advent season. Father God, we ask that you would be in our community, that where there is division, Lord, that you would sow unity. Where there is strife, you would bring peace. Lord God, there is nothing beyond you. There is nothing you cannot do. And so, Father, we ask for peace. Blessed Lord, in this divisive time, we ask your hand of blessing on our nation and its leaders. Lord, we ask that you would give them the wisdom and the strength and the courage to do what is right in your eyes, that our nation might once again be a shining city set upon a hill, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark and hurting world. Finally, Father, we ask your blessing on Frankfurt United Methodist Church, on the building, on the premises, on the people in the pews, Lord. We ask that you would use us for your great purpose, that we would be useful to your mighty kingdom, and that when our days are done and we stand before you, you would say, well done, good and faithful servants. And now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts, that we might know and speak and hear the wonderful, holy truths of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, who himself has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask a couple of ushers to come forward, please. Thank you, sir. I'm good. Thank you, gentlemen.
Thank you so much. And now, uh, if you would please, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew 7 and 21. Uh, Once you've found the place, or if you're just going to listen, um, if you're able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This morning, and for one more week, we will continue our verse-by-verse sermon series on the Gospel of Matthew. The week after next, Advent begins, and we'll step away from Matthew and begin preparing our hearts for the birth of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah. As we've said before, Jesus wasn't born in December, but that's the day the church has chosen to celebrate his arrival these last 2,000 years. Doubtless we'll speak more on this in the weeks to come. But this morning, we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount with the passage we've just read. And as has become tradition in recent weeks, we'll begin by looking at what came before it. Here in this final section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching about the relationship we have with the Lord, or more precisely, how we are to approach Him. Last week, Jesus taught about false prophets. He used the metaphor that they presented to us presented themselves to us as sheep, wearing sheep's clothing, the Lord says, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They come dressed as one of us. Those who are the sheep of the great shepherd, those in the flock of the Lord's people, but they are actually beasts who would consume us. We spoke briefly last week about the Big air quotes here, prosperity gospel. About those false teachers who coax the people of God to give them money, promising that God will, air quotes, bless them in return. Sometimes even in proportion to their giving, if you want a bigger gift, write a bigger check, they will say, I've heard it myself. These ravenous wolves prey on the hopes and fears of those who are less fortunate than they themselves, taking away money from people who do not have it to give in the name of Jesus, 
destroying lives and families and futures. As I've said before, I now say again, I hate the prosperity gospel. And those who preach it need to turn from their wicked ways and find Jesus before they stand, trembling before him. As St. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. I've seen I've seen documentaries of people sort of exposing the prosperity gospel and their preachers. Some pastor with two Rolexes on his arm, a dial on each side so he doesn't have to turn his arm over to check the time. Receiving a check from some poor lady who is cutting her medicine pills in half because she can't afford a full prescription. But she believes. God bless her. She believes. That what the man in the suit on the television says is true. That if I give my last $10,000, that God will bless me a hundredfold in return. It's evil. Jesus was standing in the temple courts, watching the people come and give their offerings to the temple. And there came a woman who gave her last two pennies, what's called the widow's mite, to the temple. Priests standing about dressed in fine linen and golden turbans commended her for her gift. And Christ said, she has given more than all of the others combined because she gave from what she did not have. Jesus is not commending her. He's condemning a system which causes someone to choose between the church and bread. And that system continues to this very day in the prosperity gospel. It is not by their words that we shall know them, Jesus says, but by their deeds, by their fruits, you shall know them. Now, the reason I keep going over the context every week is because context matters. We as Christians love to take a passage or a few verses and make a whole theology about it. If you want to see these verses, walk into any Christian bookstore and look at the wooden signs on the walls. We find some inspirational passage and make it into something it should not be or make it to be more than it is. Philippians 4.13 is a great example of a verse we do this to. Philippians 4.13 reads, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can win football games. I can get a better job. I can play video games more skillfully. I can lose weight. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But you know what verse you'll never see on the wall of a Christian bookstore? The one right before it, Philippians 4.12, which reads, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance, and need. Because that verse is, I mean, it's kind of a bummer. It's depressing. You won't find it on the wall of your kid's Sunday school classroom, but it is the context of Philippians 4.13. These are the things, being brought low, abounding, having enough, going hungry, Abundance and need, these are the things that Paul can do through Christ who gives him strength. Context matters. 
Any serious study of God's word will begin by understanding the context of the target passage. In this case, we want to read Matthew 7, verses 21 through 25, uh, 23. I got that wrong on my notes, I'm sorry. 7, 21 through 23, but we find it is in the context of a teaching on false prophets. Jesus is still teaching about false prophets here. When he says in Matthew 7 and 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There is a general concept here of everyone, but this context pushes it more towards the idea of Christian teachers and pastors. Those who are inside ravenous wolves, but who dress in fine suits with pretty ties or nice white clergy collars. Those who fatten themselves by consuming the people of God. Those people standing by when Jesus teaches this, the Pharisees, who parade about in wealth, living on the offerings of people already drowning in taxation from a corrupt Roman Empire. These Pharisees who teach the people what God has said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, perverting to a large degree the teachings of God in favor of the commandments of men, those who live in splendor while the people live in poverty, those false prophets who tell the people that all will be well if they will just give a little bit more to the temple and keep a little bit less for their greedy selves. Those who promise the blessings of God, if you will only sow, air quotes here, seed money into their ministries, those who fatten themselves on the sheep while pretending to be shepherds. They stand in the pulpits every day and cry out, Lord, Lord, but they do not have love. They may even preach right doctrine, but do not obey it. They read the Bible to get good sermons rather than to know God. And they do this to their own damnation. Jesus tells us to beware of such as these. Matthew 7 and 22, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Notice that repetition there in your name, in your name, in your name. We did these things for you, Lord, because of what you have done. We did these things. Some of these false prophets, Jesus says, will perform great works for him. Some will preach excellent sermons. Some will cast out demons and some will do various mighty works like feeding the homeless or giving to charities or building great monuments to God. But these are things that anybody can do. There's no reason that an atheist can't read a good sermon to a congregation. There's no reason an atheist can't build a beautiful church. We have atheists in pulpits preaching the word of God, or rather not preaching it. We have atheists in seminary classrooms saying great and lofty things about a God in which they do not believe. How can they do that? Even atheists will often look at the amazing person of Jesus Christ spoken of in the scriptures and find great power and wisdom in that story. Indeed, those things truly are there. But if great wisdom is all that you're looking for, allow me to recommend alongside the Bible the works of William Shakespeare and Emily Dickinson, C.S. Lewis, Henry David Thoreau, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Thomas Sowell, George Bernard Shaw, Will Rogers... And these options increase exponentially once we get away from the English-speaking world. 
There's great wisdom in the writings of Mahatma Gandhi, of Plato, of Socrates, of Confucius, of Siddhartha Gautama, and a thousand others. Men and women across the scope of time, deep thinkers pondering the depths of the universe and of the human condition, record their words for the enrichment of the world. But if wisdom is all you're looking for, there's no need to stop with the Bible. But, big capital letters right there in my, my notes, but Jesus doesn't demand of us wisdom. Jesus doesn't demand that we understand the writings of Aristotle or da Vinci. He doesn't demand that we have a firm grasp on the philosophy of René Descartes or the artworks of Vincent van Gogh. In verse 23, Jesus says, that I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. We weren't acquainted. We didn't have a meaningful relationship. You never opened your heart to me. You never came to me with your joys. You prayed when you were in need and forgot me the rest of the time. Dearly beloved, you cannot have a surface level relationship with Christ. If Sunday morning is the only time you ever spend with the one you call the most important person in your life, then he's not. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus himself writes seven letters to seven churches. One of them, the church of Laodicea, he writes to the church of Laodicea was sitting on the edge of a stream. The, the city of Laodicea sat on the edge of a stream and it was a hot spring. Water coming out at the, at the upstream end was geothermically, is that the word? Geothermically heated. That water coming out was very hot. It was wonderful for a bathing and for cooking and for all sorts of things like that. But as the stream came down, it got to the end where it emptied into the Mediterranean. And there the water was cool. The water was cold and crisp. It was good to drink. It was refreshing. It was good to play in. But the water at Laodicea was tepid. It was neither hot nor cold. It was lukewarm. And the Lord in the Revelation says, I will spew you out of my mouth. The technical term there is vomit. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you are neither hot nor cold. Now, of course, I'm not speaking to any of you. You all are on fire for the Lord. You all love Jesus and you are all great people. But you know someone who isn't. If Sunday morning is the only time you spend with Christ, then he's talking to you in this verse. Now, to be clear, we are not destroyed by our bad deeds and we are not saved by our good deeds. Good fruit will flow from good trees. Last, Jesus said last week, bad fruit will flow from bad trees. But the fruit is the result of the life in the tree, not the cause of it. <clears throat> it would be easy. We are saved because we have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, not because of our good deeds or our bad deeds. And it would be easy for this concept to devolve once again into a system of works. Do not let it. Did you miss Sunday's morning devotional last week? It's okay. You are not condemned. Did you miss your prayer time on Tuesday afternoon? It's all right. You're not condemned. Did you forget to give to the hungry on Monday of last week? It's okay. You're not condemned. Have you never prayed? 
Have you never studied your Bible? Do you come to church to be seen by others rather, or to hear the amazing rhetorical skills of your pastor, but do not engage in intimate worship of the God who bought you with his own blood? If you do those things, you need to repent. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to repent. If you do not know him, and if he does not know you, dearly beloved, nothing in this world is more important than that. Not your career, not your car, not your fancy house, or your shiny shoes. I'm talking to you, some, some of these ladies. Not even your shoes are as important. That's a joke as your relationship with Jesus Christ. In your innermost being, strive to be the one who hears from Christ, well done, thou good and faithful. Because those who stand before him and hear, I never knew you, are destined for destruction. And those who hear him say, depart from me, will indeed depart from him. Not a difficult concept. They will be separated from him and cast into outer darkness, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Reverend Dr. Billy Graham once said this. He said, hell was never made for man. I wish I could do it in his Kentucky brogue. God will never send anybody to hell. If man goes to hell, he says, he goes by his own free choice. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. God never meant that a man should go there. And God has done everything in his power to keep you out. He even gave his only son to die on that cross. You do not have to be among the crowd to whom Christ will say, I never knew you, depart from me. If you are hearing me right now, you who are sitting here, and those who will watch the video if I ever get it uploaded, please God, let me get it uploaded. If you are hearing me now, you can turn to Christ. You can come and be saved from eternal darkness. And I pray that everyone who hears me Pray that everyone in this room has already made that decision. But if you have not, come to me and let's talk. Come to me or come to any of the elders of this church and we will talk with you and pray with you. Jesus is waiting, dearly beloved one, but he will not wait forever. A final word on this passage in Matthew 7 and 23 we read, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I have to be careful when I look up, not to make eye contact with anybody. Don't worry, I don't have my glasses on. I can't see you anyway. So I'm not picking out, I'm not singling out anyone. Please don't ever think that I am. Depart from me, he says, you workers of lawlessness. I've heard Hebrew Roots teachers say that anyone who is not strictly obeying the Torah is a worker of lawlessness. And that even if you have trusted Christ alone for your salvation, that ham sandwich defeats the cross. It doesn't. I don't think that's what Christ means when he says this earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5 and 48, he said, You therefore must be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. This perfection is in the context of keeping the law to its uttermost. It's in the context of you not, it's not enough to merely not commit adultery. You cannot even lust after someone you're not married too. So if you must be perfect means you must keep the whole of the law, then how can we avoid being a worker of lawlessness without keeping the whole law? Again, we must keep it in context. Eleven verses before this, eleven verses before Matthew 7 and 23 is Matthew 7, 12. 
I implore you, I implore each and every one of you to memorize that verse in whatever your favorite Bible translation is. This week, if you don't already have that verse memorized, read it at every meal. Pull it up on your phone. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Love one another in the way that you love yourself. Treat others the way that you want them to treat you. Now, later on in the book of Matthew, we'll come to chapter 22 and verse 30, verses 37 through 40, which reads, And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If you do not want to be a worker of lawlessness, then love one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Treat other people the way you want to be treated because on this hang all the law and the prophets. Repent. Believe the gospel. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone, and you will be saved. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Blessed Lord, circumcise our hearts. Strip from us the pride that would keep us from bending the knee. Take from us our arrogance and give to us humility. Show us the reality of your world. Because when we see the truth, when we see you, Lord, we will know that we need you. Let all these things be done for your glory and your glory alone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals uh, to um, number 717, the battle hymn of the Republic. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5. Thank you. 
This morning we've had a patriotic theme to our hymns. That's, just, that's our remembrance of Veterans Day. Veterans Day honors those who have fought, those who have served, those who have stood against the tides of tyranny here on these shores and around the world. Those who have laid down their lives, those who have come home wounded and scarred and beaten and broken so that we may worship the God we choose. In the 11th century, the Muslims had waged a war of conquest throughout the Middle East, and they had been very successful. Their war of conquest reached the tip of the, the eastern tip of the Mediterranean, and there they took Jerusalem easily. The Jews who were still there were not warriors, and they were not many. The Pope organized all the armies of Europe because the Pope was the only person in the whole wide world who could be trusted to do it. If the King of England had told the King of France, send your soldiers to the Middle East and we'll stay here in guard, there would have been political machinations to worry about, but the Pope had no such political machinations. So he gathered the armies of all of Europe, and they went to Israel, and they fought the Muslims there. Now, horrible, evil things happened because of that crusade. You send men to war, and you tell them to kill, and they do horrible things. But... The Muslim advance was stopped at Jerusalem. They swept across northern Africa under the southern portion of the Mediterranean and they wiped out the ancient gods of Egypt. They wiped out the ancient religions of the Bushmen in northern Africa, but they were stopped in Jerusalem. And in 1491, they were defeated entirely. The Muslim kingdom began to shrink back. Their war of conquest ended. What happened in 1492? Christopher Columbus sailed from Portugal. Why in 1492? Because no Christian could sail a wooden plank on the Mediterranean before 1492 or the Muslims would destroy it. Dearly beloved, the reason we are Christians today, coming from our European heritage, the reason we are Christians today is because those soldiers, those crusaders, those men left their families and their crops and their homes, and they went to a horrible, miserable, wretched desert to stand up for what they believed in no less than our soldiers do today. Let's remember them and honor them for what they have done. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Isa Yehovah Panav Elecha Viasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.